Hey guys, there are all kinds of things we can say about Andrew Jackson and his time in office. He faced down a lot of problems. There was the nullification crisis, the petticoat affair. He had his cabinet resign. He highlighted the spoils system. He laid the groundwork for the Trail of Tears and the Indian Removal Act. He was not always loved. In fact, he was often hated, but he lifts up the common man. He founds one of the two major political parties that operates today. And uh, yeah, he had a bank war. One thing you should understand is that a lot of Andrew Jackson's supporters and Andrew Jackson himself have lost a lot of money based on the fact that the banks did not always behave well. In fact, Jackson learned to dislike paper money because of some of the inflation that was created by banks behaving badly. Even so, Andrew Jackson did not start the bank war. The bank war was begun by a guy named Henry Clay. Henry Clay is going to be the founder of the Whig Party, which will be the opposition party of the Democrats. He was the politician who Andrew Jackson viewed as most responsible for him losing the election in 1824 via the corrupt bargain. He is also a man known as the great compromiser because of many of the things he does as a legislator, like for example, he helped craft the Missouri Compromise during the Monroe administration. If you ever see a compromise in the antebellum period, Henry Clay had something to do with it, most likely. He didn't want to compromise with Andrew Jackson though. He wanted to pull Andrew Jackson down from the White House. In fact, Henry Clay hated Andrew Jackson with a burning hot passion. And he wanted to run for president against him. Give himself a good campaign issue during the election of 1832, Henry Clay convinced Nicholas Biddle, the president of the National Bank, to apply early for renewal of the National Bank's charter. This did not need to happen quite then, but Clay figured Andrew Jackson, who had made it quite clear he did not like the National Bank and did not think the National Bank was constitutional, would veto any renewed charter, and that would allow Henry Clay to go get the moneyed interest in the country to support him. This is why Andrew Jackson turns to his vice president, Martin Van Buren, and famously says, the bank is trying to kill me, sir, but I shall kill it. Because Andrew Jackson was good at killing things, honestly. Andrew Jackson very predictably vetoed the recharter of the second national bank on July 10th, 1832. And he did this while refuting the ruling in McCullough v. Maryland saying essentially that this was an opinion and he was a co-equal branch of government and he had the right to not sign certain legislation. Ultimately, Henry Clay misread the American people because they found all of this wonderful. They thought it was awesome that Andrew Jackson stood up to the bank because a lot of them didn't like it either. Jackson's gonna win the bank war. But what I wanna to talk to you about right now is just a lot of the crazy <laughs> that was a part of this culture. My personal favorite is the Pettus Biddle duel. Let me introduce you to the characters in this little drama. First, there was Spencer Darwin Pettus, who was born in Virginia to an American Revolutionary War veteran. Spencer will end up becoming a lawyer. He'll go west into Missouri, when Missouri was still a pretty wild frontier sort of place. And as it seems want for anyone on the frontier to do, he becomes a big fan of Andrew Jackson. Eventually, he's actually elected the only congressman to the state of Missouri. And again, full-on Jacksonian Democrat. On the other side of this little drama is a man named Thomas Biddle, who had been born in Pennsylvania to a very powerful, very wealthy family. Thomas Biddle served his country honorably during the War of 1812. 
he did other things of note, like go on the Yellowstone expedition, which eventually would result in us having Yellowstone National Park. Really, you should go see that if you haven't. It is one of the country's most beautiful gems. Thomas was a good looking guy who married well and settled with his wife in St. Louis, Missouri. In St. Louis, Thomas Biddle ran a branch of the Second National Bank. It is also worth knowing his brother was Nicholas Biddle, who was the president of the Second National Bank. You can surely predict how a Jacksonian Democrat and Congressman, Spencer Pettus, could run in opposition to a brother of the National Bank president and also bank manager himself, Thomas Biddle. I have often heard people say today that politicians have gone way beyond civility, that they are not kind to each other, that they say things in public that they should absolutely not say. And who am I to argue? That is totally true. I wish that we were all nicer to one another, but, but, but my silly, naive students, this is not new. Maybe Twitter is, but attacking people in public? No. Spencer Pettis, as a politician, attacked Nicholas Biddle, the president of the National Bank, all the time in his stump speeches. And he would write these scathing editorials about the banking class to the local newspapers in Missouri. He would criticize not just Nicholas Biddle, but everyone who was anyone who had anything to do with banks. So of course that will run down to Thomas. Spencer Pettis insulted Thomas Biddle's wife when he insinuated that there was something wrong with her because she hadn't had children. This really got Thomas Biddle's goat. And he started to throw insults too. In fact, because Thomas Biddle probably felt his own manhood had been questioned since he had not yet sired any kids, he called Spencer Pettis one of the worst possible things you could call any other man in the antebellum era. I am talking an insult that almost always led to a duel because it was the type of thing that just could not stand. He called Spencer Pettis skim milk. Even so, these words of Thomas Biddle's were not what sparked the duel. There were actions <laughs> that did that. Thomas Biddle broke into a room where Spencer Pettis was staying and he used a whip, a bull whip, to beat this congressman to within an inch of his life. That prompted Spencer Pettis to demand satisfaction. He wanted to duel Thomas Biddle. Since Thomas Biddle had been challenged, he was the guy who got to choose the terms of the duel, meaning he got to set the parameters where they were gonna go, a place called Bloody Island, and what weapons they were gonna use, pistols, and how far apart they were gonna be. Y'all, this part is a little bit funny. Thomas Biddle was known to be a bad shot because he was super nearsighted. His solution to get around that was to have him and Pettis only march five feet away from each other, then turn around and fire together. The outcome is really predictable. They shoot each other, they're right on top of each other and each of them is going to die. Did people talk about how absolutely insane it was to have a sitting U.S. congressman get killed by a former war hero who was killed over this stupid duel of words and questioning of manhood and skim milk and your wife doesn't have kids and your brother isn't good. What? No one was calling anyone foolish. Everyone looked at these guys and said, oh, they were brave. They kept their honor intact. How good was that? Of course you had to go duel. This little incident should help explain to you a little bit about why Andrew Jackson was so popular for many. 
what the culture was like during the age of Jackson, and really in the antebellum era in general. Antebellum meaning before the war, the Civil War. Maybe we can even take a little bit of heart in the fact that while our current politicians sometimes say and do things that I find beyond the pale and not what I would want my own child to say or do, perhaps they've actually gotten better? Perish the thought. I'll see you later. Bye.